What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. We've got a, uh, a true North Carolina um, local legend on the podcast tonight. We'll introduce him here in a second. Before we get going, I, I can see him here. He's already shaking his head at me when, when I said that, but but I believe that he is that. So uh, I'm going to call him that, and I'm going to stick to it. But uh, before I introduce him, I'm just going to let you all know about our Patreon page. We have some exclusive Patreon content on there, some different um, levels of sponsorship. You can help uh, help this show financially. Um the time that, that I put into it and and the expense behind it, um, it's it's uh, it's super. Uh, we're super thankful for that. Um, also, go check out our Facebook page, uh, Eastern Current Fishing, where you can talk with. It's really just made for all the listeners to be able to hop on there, you know, share pictures, share stories, ask questions, and uh, hopefully find some buddies you can go fishing with. But uh, that's Eastern Current Fishing on Facebook, um, and uh, I think that's all all the rambling I'm going to do with this podcast. Sometimes I have a little bit more, but. And I'm not going to do that today, but I'm going to introduce y'all to my man, Brian Dehart. What's going on, Brian? How you doing? It's, uh, I don't know if you know it or not, but um, it's raining. Yeah, it is raining. raining. There too. So this is a great time to do this because no, uh, I don't have to clean the boat or anything. It's getting clean for me. I know. I've been leaving mine out in the driveway and just uh, pull the plug out and <laughs> let it just clean it for me. Let it roll. It's not yeah. quite as powerful as the power washer down the street, but it does the job. So... No, this this is insane, man. What we've been, you know, it's like tropical system, but it's not tropical or whatever. But it's crazy the amount of rain the last few days. Insane amount of rain. It's it's the inshore fishing. It's been like spread out enough and not enough like downfall to really hurt our inshore fishing too much. Um, but I haven't been able to get out there enough to really feel it out either. So we'll see what's going on. I got an offshore trip tomorrow. Some bottom fishing. Um, so I, I'll, cool. that'll be fine. But um, yeah, man. But yeah, it's it, has it affected your fishing up there at all with the when you had the windows to get out that that salinity level dropping and all that all that runoff and rain. Yeah, it's such an interesting scenario up here because um, if you think about it in Manio, you know we're down we're we're down current downstream of the mountains of Virginia. So with the with the Roanoke River going to thirty five thousand for two weeks. And then you put this rain on top of the amount of rain that's coming out of the river systems from that tropical system a couple yeah. of weeks ago, man. It changes up a lot down here, um, and it will move some fish around. So the interesting thing is, um, I don't know if it works, you know, down your way or whatever, but um, you know what a saltwater wedge is. Mm-hmm. We'll get we'll get we'll get a lot of rain in the marsh, and it'll it'll you know, be draining black water, just pure black Coca-Cola looking water out of the marshes and out of the creeks and everything. And, um, you know, you, you won't see any bait on top. You won't like, well, it, it's dead. Everything just moved. But, um, but there's actually a saltwater wedge underneath of it. And so if there's not a lot of wind mixing it up, there'll be saltwater underneath of that. Fresh water is like a separate body of water running across the top of it. Yeah. And until you get a lot of wind, you know, it, it won't mix up, but we've had some wind too. The other interesting thing about what we get on this uh, scenario up here is all this northeast wind, east wind, going to southeast, I guess tomorrow or whatever, but it pushes seawater in the inlet. And so um, when we're able to get back out and it actually settles down, the wind settles down a little bit, there'll be green ocean water, you know, way up the sound. Oh, cool. Mixing with, mixing with rainwater coming down the system. So, dude, it's it's a trip. I mean, yeah. really trying to keep up with, with what's going on. You really don't know till you get out there. Yeah. And uh, you kind of just go where the good, you know, where your northeast spots are. And when the wind shifts, you go where your southwest spots are. And um, and just you have to deal with the water, whatever it's doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's wild. But it's just such an interesting, I guess, dynamic here because of where we are with the uh, with Oregon Inlet being such a shallow narrow inlet it's really just an outlet it rarely lets much water in unless you get a, a consistent northeast wind pattern for a few days which is what we got now yeah yeah, yeah. and it's, it's crazy seeing the amount of uh, talking to some of these locals around here um you know I, we won't get into climate change sea level rise all that <laughs> stuff but i can tell you that there's more water around roanoke island now than there used to be wow. talking to uh Talking to some, you know, some of these boys I grew up with that live on the water, and that have historical landmarks, you know, over across the creek or whatever, and they're like, you know, there's a there's a there's a metal stake over there that ten years ago used to be there pretty much every day, and now I only see it 
at extreme low tides. Yeah. So it's pretty wild some of that stuff's going on. I think it's just a function of, man, the water just can't get out. You know, it just don't get out of our inlets like it used to, and it just stays backed up, which is not good for the system. Yeah. You know, you're you're, you're blessed because you have a, a good tidal fluctuation. And if you've ever spent much time up here, you know, right at Oregon Inlet, we have some tidal fluctuation. In Manio, there is no tide. It's all wind current. So that inlet is not big enough and deep enough to move enough water to affect the tide just eight or ten miles away from the inlet. It's, it's, it's just, it will be difficult, you know, just coming in here the first time, looking at a tide chart going, okay, I think I want to be there. Yeah. At, you know, the tide, tide should start falling at 8.03. Dude, none of that <laughs> stuff works. <laughs> Unless you're right around the inlet. When you're right around the inlet, you can kind of base some stuff off of that. But okay. The rest of that tide chart stuff is out the window, and it makes it diff- more difficult to fish up here. Yeah, I, I feel like it would. Um, you know, we base so much of our stuff around the tide down here. Uh, but but yeah. some of those fisheries, some of the fisheries that I fish, you know, that, that don't have the tide, it, it's it's nice too because it's it's one less variable you have to think about. You know what I mean? It's one less. The fish, if they were there yesterday, they're probably going to be there today because the yeah. the tide's not moving around too much. But before we get too deep into the techie fishing stuff. Sure. Let's, uh, I want to hear your backstory. Tell people your backstory. Where'd you grow up? How'd you get into fishing? How'd it bring you to where you are today? Um, no, I got, you know, I was, some people in this, especially this day and time, there's a lot of, uh, fatherless homes and you got kids that are growing up without a dad. Well, I grew up with, I was blessed with two dads. I got a, a biological father that, you know, that loves me, lives away from here, but, uh, biological father and um and then my mom him and my mom split up when i was really young uh-huh. uh and my mom remarried and i got a you know a stepfather that raised me um and he was my dad is from virginia my dehart name is out of virginia gotcha but my mom is local outer banks forever you know she's a, a daniels gallop Cudworth. I mean, there's a lot of blood there that is local, you know, to this area. And um, neither one of my dads fished, hunted, could care could care less about any of that stuff. And um, but I kind of, you know, I just always felt like I had there's something there that I didn't realize until later on um, where it came from. But um, I just, you know, growing up when my mom and dad remarried, mom remarried to my stepdad. We moved from, from Manio, where my mom was living, to Man's Harbor, which is just across the bridge on the mainland. Yeah. And, you know, so now I was three years old. And from the time I was three till I was, uh, till, till I was 12, I lived over there. And that's where I really cut my teeth, you know, fishing. And no boat, you know, no nobody taking me. There's Really, there's so many good organizations now that are taking kids that would have been in my position you know, and getting them outside and hunting and fishing. And there's so many different ways kids can get introduced to the outdoors. I didn't have that. Yeah. Uh, But what I did have and, and had a ball with was, um, I lived on a canal and and a ditch, you know, what we call it around here. I lived on a ditch, um, that was full of bass and brim, um, white perch at times or whatever. And I had a Zebco 202 and a beetle spin. (laughs) Nice. And to this day, to this day, I can I near about believe that you catch anything swimming on a beetle spin, <laughs> and you know, so that that's how I cut my teeth, man. I fished every ditch, every pothole, every mud puddle, every pond in Man's Harbor, the Sound Shore, you know, all over there on the mainland, and um, yeah, that's what I tell people. I cut my teeth with a beetle spin, a Zebco 202, and a bicycle, nice. and just you know went where I wanted to go. And I had a few buddies that we fished with, and. Um, and, you know, and, and with that, I had to learn a lot of stuff the hard way. I mean, I, I feel sorry for some of the bass I caught years ago and was trying to figure out how to clean. Nobody showed me how to clean a fish. I had to figure out how to clean a fish. I did it with a buck knife. You know, it was crazy. It was brutal. It was pretty brutal. But, <laughs> That's funny. Um, but, but my mom, um, I got a younger brother um, from that marriage, and, and, and for my 16th birthday, or I'm sorry, I take it back. For my the Christmas that I was 16, that Christmas, when my brother was uh, was 12, my parents got us 
collectively a 16 foot Carolina skiff with a 30 horsepower tiller Yamaha motor. And dude, it might as well have been a 60 foot whatever sport fish is your favorite brand. I mean, I was, I was the cat's meow, man, for a long time. And uh, that's how I really started learning the fishery was bigger than the bicycle and the Zebco. Yeah. And, and from there, it was, it was good. I mean, I really, had a, I really enjoyed that time in that boat. I should have died a thousand times. <laughs> I did the dumbest stuff imaginable. Caught uh, everything that you can catch within 15 miles of the coast, I think I've caught in that 16-foot Carolina skiff. <laughs> and I can, tell you, I can tell you some crazy stuff. I, I will tell you a funny story about that boat. And I, I ramble, so cut me off whenever you want to redirect me. No, you're good. I love it. Man, I had a um, couple of my roommates came down from, uh, from – from, they were both from High Point. They grew up in High Point. Mm -hmm. And we were in this little cut right here in uh, Manny on Roanoke Island called John's Ditch. And we were catching, at, you know, there's puppy drum by the hundreds in there. And all we had was kind of like trout gear, you know, really. But I did have two – uh, trolling rods. I figured if we got bored, we could go outside the inlet and we troll for Spanish mackerel, which is again, which is funny, you know, with the, the inshore six pack boats out there and you're out there in a little 16 foot bathtub <laughs> with a tiller, you know, catching Spanish mackerel. But um, they got bored. They said, we want to go to the ocean. I said, good grief, boys. Okay. I had to stop at Oregon Inlet and get more fuel. And we went out the inlet. And again, all I had was trout rods and those two trolling rods. And we were catching some Spanish mackerel. Um, well, one of my roommates had, have you ever seen the little Shakespeare rod, that telescopic little backpack? Yeah, oh yeah. Shakespeare rods. You know, they got six pound tests on them, a reel about that big around. And um, named D, D Miller. So um, there used to be an old anchor buoy outside the inlet. It's not there anymore. And it was um it's a good place to you know just kind of slide by and there'll be a cobia swimming around it and sure enough you know we were i'd ease by that thing we we're soaking wet a thunderstorm got us we we're soaking wet and as i'm coming by that anchor buoy there's there's like five little little guys you know just perfect perfect trout rod cobia i said this is going to be a blast and these five little guys and they wanted to catch well i couldn't have you know i, I cast it um set the hook i'm fighting the fish myself and d he's upset with me because i'm not letting him catch the fish and so he picks up his little mickey mouse shakespeare rod <laughs> with a you know little green curly tail everybody i saw you fish you know back then curly tail you know little mr twister gotcha right. lime green red heads i mean that was the trout rig you know and um and so he casts back at the at the buoy and of all these little guys that were swimming around the buoy, a tank comes up off the bottom and like runs this little, most of the time it happens the other way. You know, most of the time you cast and the little cobia beats the big cobia to the, to the jig or right. whatever. And they eat it and you miss your shot. Well, this time the 60 pounder eats the quarter ounce grub and oh. he, you know, he sets the hook and I'm freaking out. I'm like, that's a world record. That's a world record. You know, six pound. Well, 16 feet doesn't seem like a long boat, but it's a very long ways when you're going from the bow to him in the stern, trying to get to him before he cranks that drag all the way down. You know, he's like, he's taking on my line. I said, don't, don't, it's slow motion. Don't do it. Click, click, click. <laughs> Broke him off. I wanted to beat him with that little Shakespeare rod. I bet. Man, you have no idea what you just lost. You know, so that was... That's a funny little um, Carolina skiff story, but there's plenty more where that came from. But uh, that, that's the background, man. I I went to college and went to UNC Greensboro. Um, really didn't, you know, Greensboro just seemed like it was far enough away that I couldn't come home every weekend, but it was close enough that I could I could come home if I needed to. Yeah, yeah. And, um, so that was kind of the deal there. I met so many cool people out there, and really that network in the time frame that I was in Greensboro – actually jump started my guide business nice um i tanked i went out there you know i thought oh, it's funny whatever the name of the business school out there was the brian school of business so it was divine i was supposed to go to school there <laughs> well two semesters of economics and accounting 
and they didn't invite me back to the Bryan School of Business. <laughs> and um, so now I'm scratching my head trying to figure out what in the world am I going to do, you know. And I was introduced to uh, one of my you know, one of my roommates um, was in the you know sounds sounds silly you take it for what it's worth, but then it was called the Leisure Studies Program at UNC Greensboro, and um, now most every curriculum has changed in is parks, recreation, and tourism. That's basically what it was. Yeah, I'm like that's a no-brainer. How, that's how what I was I in school for. That was a curriculum to begin with. Right. Well, not only, I mean, because I kind of had it in my mind. You know, I grew up renting jet skis and pulling water skiers for my daytime job and working in restaurants at night time. So I, I, I don't have a whole lot of patience for, you know, the generation now that has no job when I had to work too. And I enjoyed it, man. You know, it was cool. And um, anyway, that uh, I met a ton of people out there. And one of the most instrumental people I met was, ended up being my academic advisor named Dr. Uh, James Sellers, Jim Sellers. And Dr. Sellers is probably the best, you know, you'll appreciate this. And I, and, and it was confirmed through some other, you know, some other notable names as I was, um, involved, you know, got in, in the fly fishing world. My academic advisor, one of the best sight fishermen with, with small, you know, technical dry fly stuff anywhere around, certainly in wow. the Southeast. He was very, um, Dr. Sellers was, He's probably the, the, the best fly fisherman you've never heard of. Right, he's that right. guy. Yeah. Makes sense, you know. He's the guy that uh, he, I, I worked in the mountains in uh, Newland at Tow River Sportsman's Club one summer as an internship. Coolest internship anybody's ever had. Um, and, uh, you know, some heavy hitters, high rollers. They invited some pretty good, you know, some, some pretty high-end clients or whatever. Dr. Sellers was the guy that was brought up from Greensboro to guide the guests of these guys, you know, when they brought the, the heavy hitters in. Yeah. And, um, and, you know, personal friends with Gary Borger. I know you know who yeah. Gary is. Yeah. Um, I got a chance to fish with Gary. He won't remember it because I was just a snotty nosed little, you know, kid, but I had a chance to actually walk the river with Gary Borger trout fishing in the mountains of North Carolina because of Dr. Sellers. That was cool because that dude, is um, he's a pretty special fly fisherman, and he told me that Dr. Sellers was the best of the best. And wow. it's coming from Gary, so that, that meant something. Well, that's how I cut my teeth fly fishing was with him. Came home, you know, graduated. I worked uh, an internship one summer to finish out my curriculum, and then basically started guiding immediately after that. And I started an inshore fishing business in a 16-foot Carolina skiff with a 30-horsepower tiller motor. Nice. And uh, – well, you know, it's probably the laughing stock for a lot of the guys around here, but there's, you, you couldn't tell me anything. I mean, we caught everything swimming. Um, I learned so much. You know, I never had a depth finder, never had a GPS for years. Could, really couldn't afford one. You know, back then you were taking full day trips for like 150 bucks, you know. Yeah. Um, I think it's 20, 26, 27 years ago. Um, and so times have changed, but I told everybody my depth finder was a 16 foot shove pole <laughs> and I learned everything I needed to know. If it was over chest deep, I didn't want to fish there because most of the time there wasn't any fish there. So man, my whole gig has always been about shallow water fishing. And, and I could tell if the bottom was hard with that shove pole. I could tell if it was soft. Yeah. I could tell everything I needed to know with that 16 foot pole that a buddy of mine made for me. That's awesome. And, uh, Dude, so the first probably five years, and you'll appreciate this, um, the fir- probably the first five years that I fished on the Roanoke River, I never had a I never had a depth finder. I could not tell you what was going on on the bottom, where those big bodies would fit. I had to learn the river at the surface about you know where the fish were going to be day in and day out on different water conditions before I ever knew what was going on under the surface. And that I think that helped me a lot. Sometimes um, that would be nice up there to not see all the yeah. fish piled up there and not be able to get them to eat. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's, um, that'll hurt your feelings sometimes oh, when you yeah. drift across the place and they're, they're six feet thick and you drop a jig in them and you're popping that thing and, and all you feel is tail slaps. Yeah. Oh yeah. And you know, they're there, but they won't eat. But yeah, that can be frustrating. That, uh, 
that river started, really jump started, you know, the guide business for me because I didn't have it. There, there was Brian Horsley um, was down here, and he had been doing some wade fishing trips, and he had just gotten a boat, a um, little flats boat, a little huge red fisher. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he was running some inshore trips. And, um, and then I came in behind him, and at that point, well, that was kind of it. You know, wasn't there? You going to get speckled trout fishing? You know, you were just kind of out to lunch down here. Um, and we were fished away from it. You know, we didn't we didn't interact a whole lot. We were different places. He could cover a lot more water with that rig than I could in a skiff. Um, and you know, so but just over time, another another guide gets in from somewhere else, and then here comes somebody else, and then somebody on a big boat retires, and they want to start, you know, inshore fishing, and and the fleet started to grow. Right. But technically, it was Brian. You know, there were some guys that fished in the 70s. Um, there was, you know, quite a few inshore guys around. It kind of crossover. You know, there were Man's Harbor fishing for rockfish, around the inlet for the big bluefish and the, and the big drum. And um, and then it kind of faded, you know. And and then he, he kind of jump-started everything, and I was right behind him. And then, I mean, you wouldn't know it now, but there was, there was two, and then there was... 102 right <laughs> as you can imagine i mean they're everywhere now you know inshore guys are a dime a dozen but um but they didn't used to be so yeah just like on roanoke um and i'm sure he, he you know he felt this same scenario um talking about brian but i mean we had to learn a lot that uh there wasn't a whole lot of people to teach us anything right there wasn't a whole lot of people to show anything um so you kind of uh and you know at some point whether well, it's tonight or a different time or whatever we'll, we'll get kind of deep into some speckled trout stuff up here but um i i used to think i knew a lot of you know that i'd learned a lot about speckled trout fishing and then now i'll go back and tell you that what i thought i knew i really didn't ever know a whole lot yeah um and it, and i keep i keep saying that that those things keep they teach me something every day just about crazy thing yeah well let's let's dive into that let's talk about um, cause I feel like that's what a lot of people, you know, think about when they think about that inshore outer banks fishing is the strong yeah. speckled trout fishery that y'all have there year round really, which is cool. You know, spring, summer, fall, winter, you can catch a nice speckled trout there. So kind of take me through the history of that, that fishery and kind of, you know, what, how those fish act, how you like to target those fish, kind of taking through the whole, the whole process. Yep. So, um, there we lose we lose our fish our inshore fish in in the winter time okay uh we're not we're not the place where they where they spend the winter you know they go and this is what's interesting you know about about that entire fishery because it, it's it's such a, a a weird dynamic because selena about this rain thing mm-hmm. i mean it all it's a full circle um our fish you know we got a great uh, surf fishery in the in the fall, some in the winter, whatever, and then you got to drive an hour, you know, thirty minutes or an hour in the in the the January February stuff um, to catch many speckled trout from say Manio, which is where I live. We we'll just call it Manio from Roanoke Island um, because they go, you know, they go up the creeks, they go freshwater, brackish water up the creeks and spend the winters up there, which is where they're so susceptible to you know cold sun events. Well. So the fish leave us, and the interesting thing about every year is you never know exactly when they're coming back, because it really depends on um, on a on a drier year, dry, you know, drier pattern, like we had the end of last year. The fish will go. When I say above us, I don't mean just due north. I mean, but in the system above Roanoke Island. Um, and they'll, a lot of fish will winter in the Alligator River tributaries, in the Albemarle Sound tributaries. Um, and those fish get back to us pretty quick in, say, March and April, if they're there. Mm-hmm. Uh, but on a wet scenario, when we've had a lot of rain, you know, been a, a wet pattern or whatever, there's not many fish that go up there. Uh, a lot of fish will go, you know, to the Noose, Pamlico River, Pungo River, and they'll stay way down below us. And depending on the situation, 
um, you never, you know, those fish might be a little bit later getting back to us gotcha. in the springtime. So we kind of got a void here. Um, you know, I'd, I'd say we should call it December to March. Okay. Kind of got a void right here around Roanoke Island or Oregon Inlet or, you know, whatever. Um, some of the surf guys, when the fish are, fish are moving up and down to surf, you know, they'll catch them when we don't have them inside. We're typically waiting either for fish either coming in or coming from away from us to get back to us. Gotcha. Yep. So, you know, in the, the, the kind of the indicator is uh, we got one little old bridge over here on the causeway. It's called the little bridge or the causeway bridge. Um, and of course this year with the, the COVID situation, you know, nobody, nobody was working. Um, when, when the fishing's good or the surfing's good, half the people down here don't work anyway. <laughs> right. Um, the, um, there was a, you know, the speckled trout got, it's a cut um, with a lot of current and a, the deep water. It's just a great scenario, great environment for, for speckles. And um, it's off the main, you know, sound. It's, um, and it was loaded with speckled trout this spring in April. And there was 100 people on both sides of the bridge. Dude, they shut the bridge down. Because of social distancing, they put barricades on both ends of the bridge and it wouldn't let anybody fish. <laughs> oh, my um, gosh. The crazy thing about it is, which I don't understand, they, and I don't know if it's the town or the state or whoever did it, but, uh, I mean, it ticked a lot of people off, and it really, um, it was terrible because, it, you know, it, nobody was hurting anything, and it was great fishing. Yeah. Great situation. Well, they opened it up on the south side of the bridge, but they kept the barricade on the north side. I mean, you can walk, you know, the whole length of this bridge. I mean, it's only a hundred yards, not even a hundred yards long. Um, and so, you, if you can fish it from a boat and get it from both different directions. Well, if you're on the south side of the bridge, there's everybody bombing because the bridge was open and the fish were over there. Well, we were able to run around a bunch of days on the north side and fish right there. I mean, right where you want to be, because nobody was standing up there on the on the bridge fishing. It had some really good. That's, but they've opened it back up now. When the tourists get here, it turns into two ounce pyramid sinkers. Oh wow! They can cast those further than the guys with the quarter ounce jig heads, and so you don't want to be anywhere around that bridge when the when the pyramid sinkers show yeah, up. Yeah, no, it doesn't sound like it. They'll be trying to run you out of there. Yeah, but that's the deal. I mean, our fish will show up and start showing up. I've caught them in March, um, but typically I don't expect to catch my first speckled trout in Dare County until uh, sometime in April, then May is typically when it starts to really spread out and get pretty good. Um, our June fishing can be really good. And, uh, you know, summertime stuff, you know, the drill man up here, again, without the tide, um, there's so much different types of habitat. And uh, these fish move a lot. And that's what I learned that I, I used to think that I knew that when a body of fish got somewhere, they were going to be there for a while. And, and what I figured out, and some of it had to do with the tagging program information um, that I started seeing some tag returns and tag results from. But um, these things move all over the place. Yeah. And, and a lot of, I mean, they cover a lot of water, not just move from here across the sound, but, you know, 30 or 50 miles in a couple of days. And, um, you know, one of the, the, the one that actually, the two tagging scenarios that uh, that blew my mind completely had a paradigm shift about what I thought I knew about speckled trout and both of it came from tagging information and one was um, a fish was tagged up here behind the old Coast Guard the Coast Guard station here at Oregon Island. and I, I always thought if that fish was there in October then more than likely he was going in the ocean spend the winter you know out there in the ocean somewhere um, that fish, if I'm not mistaken, that fish was recaptured seven days later in the Noose River. Wow. So he swam all the way across the open Pamlico Sound in October going to the Noose River. And uh, I was scratching my head. I'm like, there ain't no way, man. That's just a, that's, that was just an eyeball situation. The next summer, a fish was tagged early in the year in, um, I believe, in the New River, near Jacksonville area. Mm -hmm. And that tag was recaptured in the Croatan Sound 30 days later. Wow. Do you, do you know what kind of GPS system a fish has to have to make it from Jacksonville to Man's Harbor? 
in 30 days. It's unbelievable. And so if, if, a, if a fish, meaning a body of fish, can cover that amount of water and those different water conditions and everything they have to get through to get here in 30 days, dude, there's no telling where these fish go and where they come from. Yeah. And that really, that really opened my eyes. Yeah, that that's that's incredible, man. That's the the more I talk to people on this podcast that have done these different tagging um, programs for di- uh, multiple different species, the the amount of mm-hmm. crazy information I've learned and and just mind boggling yeah. stuff. Like I had a, a guy on the other day from the Chesapeake Bay, and he was talking about a tagging program for for cobia. And you know, you think there's all these massive am- amounts of cobia up there, and he was talking about how it's really not that large of a population of fish, the cobia. And he was he, he 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 wanted to start tagging because he hooked a fish or no I think he was cruising in his tower and saw this fish with a uh, with a bucktail hanging out of its back and so mm. uh, yeah I think yeah and then he saw it three days in a row he saw the same fish three days in a row with the bucktail out of its back Good grief. and so then wow. that had his wheels turning so he started tagging fish and they had one fish I think that they had tagged that they caught like seven times in a week. Like it was caught seven, seven times in one week, one small cobia, um, and so it's it's crazy the things you'll start to learn uh, when you can. That's scary, put, actually. Yeah, it is. It is scary. It's like the, there's not nearly as many cobia up there as people probably think there are, is what it boils down to. But um, but yeah, that that's very interesting. Well, up there, it's always so interesting because trout live in so many different environments. They live in so many different. Uh, or they feed and, and actively hunt in so many different scenarios. What are you looking for in, in a good trout fishing spot around, you know, Roanoke Island, around Oregon Inlet, all that stuff? That is, that's, how long is this thing supposed to last? Because <laughs> that's, I, I can talk hours on that question you just asked right there, and I'll do what I can to, um, well, let's just talk, let's just sure. talk on the main point, like the, the couple main things you're looking yep. for. Right. Um, the, there's so many different uh, variables up here, and and um, I guess you know, everybody's got their favorite little spots. And this is what what I set out to do when I first really started getting. I mean, heavy into speckled trout fishing. Um, and, and I mean, I, I say this in an un, unpretentious way, but when I wanted to make a name for myself, because you know. You, you got to market yourself to build right. business, especially when there's nobody else doing any marketing. This was way before social media, way before you know websites or anything. And um, I set out to to just learn spots. And what the um, the biggest thing about it is 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 learning the what makes a spot good on certain conditions, certain situations. And how to replicate that spot multiple times around the county, and um, so when there was fish on the west side of Roanoke Island, it's kind of easy cheesy deal back there because you just most everybody's just point hopping, but there are some points back there, you know, just green green marsh grass, yeah. you know, spartina grass, black needle rush type points and stuff back there, um, and a lot of the banks are you know, a foot, uh, three or four or five feet deep. And then they just taper off from there, all kind of a hard mud bottom. And, um, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of differences, but there are, and there are some points that are consistently better than other ones. And, um, and so I just set out trying to figure out, you know, why is it better? What is the dynamic here that makes the fish want to be here? And not on that point, that's only 75 yards away okay. and it just replicate those things. So, Kind of what I, and I, you hear me tell people this all the time. They're like, oh, you know, you're, you know, blah, 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 speckled trout fisherman, this, that, and the other. I'm like, look, I say, y'all understand. I'm not as good a speckled trout fisherman as everybody thinks I am. But I just got more spots than everybody else does. <laughs> and so I'm able to take my clients to more good places. I shoot, Judd, have you, do you ever get out fished by your clients? I get out fished by my clients all the time. No, I never Some get out fished by my clients. I'm just I, kidding. I mean, it cracks me up. I'm happy to because they go away happy and they outfish the guide and they got a story to tell. But my whole gig has always been about spots. If I've got more spots than you do, I'm going to win most days. Right. And so um, 
man, we got, you know, we got places around Oregon Inlet that uh, the typical habitat down there that uh, everybody's liking to fish, which I really enjoy. I mean, I thoroughly enjoy it. It's all going to be waist deep to chest deep um, uh, grass flats. I mean, just vast, just uh, hundreds of acres of these grass beds down there, much like, I, you know, watching Brett talking, um, uh, when Brett Barley was talking to you yeah. about fishing there in Hatteras and the different, you know, the depth, and like we find four feet deep, you know, grass beds or whatever. I mean, it's a home run. Um, so much shallow water, so many sloughs, a lot of, you got tide fluctuation down there. And, uh, I enjoy catching fish in a, on those shallow grass flats, uh, situations down there. Well, you, you come north, of Oregon Inlet and you start to get into you know some shoals there's some mixed grass you know kind of broken grass areas some big shoals with uh, broken grass on them they got sloughs that run through them um, and you got to learn you know all those places and then there's there's channels and then you get up around Roanoke Island you know Duck Island Roanoke Island you're actually fishing shoreline um, and sloughs and creeks and um, marsh points um, stuff like that. And then, um, you know, we got really four, um, if you count, you know, the bridge up there at Curry Tuck, which right now is fishing pretty good. Uh, we got four bridges you can fish. There's a bridge you can fish in Dare County every day is holding speckled trout, whether it's the Pirates Cove Bridge, um, goes from Manio to Nags Head. You got two bridges that go from Manio to Mans Harbor, what we call the old bridge and the new bridge. Both of them hold fish consistently, and um, and then you got the you know you got two bridges up there at Curry Tuck, Mm -hmm. the Wright Memorial Bridge that go across that are holding it's holding fish right now, and um, and so and then on the Mans Harbor side, the west side of the Curlitan Sound is the same deal. It's a lot of marsh banks, um, and and some of the things some of the guys that are familiar with throughout you know there's been erosion in my lifetime. Um, and a lot more over the years or whatever, but there's 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 old points that were good and old islands that were good that aren't there anymore. And if you look at my bottom machine, man, I've got a ton of stuff marked that is um that is old islands, marsh islands that have eroded away over the years. And so you may see me fishing a hundred yards off the bank somewhere, and like that dude's out to lunch. Well, I'm fishing on chunks of old marsh islands that may have two or three foot of relief in six or seven feet of water wow and so when you current running over that those old chunks of islands and all those roots and everything that holds so many little bait fish and who knows what else down there you get hung up a ton but if you if you you know you locate these old chunks of islands and um we catch a lot of fish on that kind of stuff so really you know i mean I, i could i could tell you if you came up here I can give you five places that are easy to find. Everybody else knows about them. They're all community spots. Um, and you can start your speckled trout journey on the Outer Banks. In those five places, you're a good enough fisherman. I say, all right, Joe, go replicate them. And as you replicate them, you're going to be golden. Yeah. And so, yeah, that's kind of the deal. So much different habitat. I think now, that's... You know, if you want to Oh, sorry. I think that's what's so interesting about speckled trout is is they're like a they're like a largemouth bass. You can really pattern them extremely well. Whereas like redfish, much harder to pattern. Um, you definitely there's patterns to them, but those speckled trout you can figure out. You know, all right, they're eating a um, you know a mirror lure really well. They're eating a topwater well. They're sitting on yeah. they're they're in six feet of water right now on uh, you know relief or they're on bridges right now. Like they're just they totally are patternable fish. And once you start to realize that and put those trends together, it just starts, I mean, your speckled trout thinking just starts to really, really uh, multiply the amount of spots that you run by. You're like, oh, I should try that. There's probably a fish on that. And you throw in there and first cast, bam. And you're like, okay, these are totally patternable fish. So. Yeah, probably the most, um, the most rewarding thing that I do, um, you know, again, you may think I'm goofy. Um, Not at all. I know. And I, well, I mean, I know you, you understand where I'm coming from because I know that you're active in your church or whatever. Mm-hmm. But um, I can't begin to tell you how many times, you know, because I have to compete with a lot of guys up here. Yeah. And obviously the, the guide business is, is somewhat of a competitive business. And um, some people make it more competitive than it should be. <laughs> but um, 
and you know, there's, there's, there's egos involved and everything else. But, um, if you want to continue to be at the top of your game, then you have to be at the top of your game. You know, and that sounds stupid, but that's just the way it is. And so I ride around on a consistent basis and I did it just the other day. I've done it a, a number of times. I ride around like, all right, Lord, you know, I, this pe- these people are paying me to be their guide. I need you to be mine. Right. And I need a new, I need a new spot today. <laughs> and just, I cannot begin to tell you. I know it's uh, people will go, oh, you're you're a goofball. I can't begin to tell you how many times I have prayed that prayer, and ended up I watch my bottom machine constantly when I'm running. And when you're running, you know, 30 knots, and you see one little blip on the screen. You better back her down and go back and see what in the heck it was. If you're up here, you know, yeah. again, your fishery down is so much different um, with all that tide. Or I don't have that tide to depend on um, for certain spots or whatever. Then uh, I got to have I got to have spots in all different kinds of situations that that will hold fish um, through the course of, you know, nine months or eight months worth of fishing up here. Right. And one of the coolest spots I've ever found. Um, and I, I did just that, you know, I've been riding around, I was catching some fish. Um, we had, we had some speckled trout. It was a good year. This was in October and it's probably been 10 years ago. Um, I was running from, I got some, I got some places that 99% of the fishing public up here have no clue even exists, you know, over on the backside of Nags Head. There's some, um, some some old oyster oyster lumps back there that most people have you know the, the recreational fishermen don't know they're there some of the commercial guys do and um i was leaving there we had caught some fishing i was running to machu's creek which is eh, probably six miles across there or something seven miles it was late in the kind of late in the day beautiful afternoon and again i'm watching my bottom machine and i'm running along and all of a sudden man i see something just spike straight up on, on the bottom machine. I kid you not, when I, I pulled it back so hard and so fast, I think everybody in the boat like face planted on the front deck. <laughs> and they turned around and looked at me and said, I said, boys, I found it. They said, what are you talking about? I said, I have looked for this place. I've heard about it. Nobody, I've never known anybody that knows what this is. And they, I said, I found the lost colony. They said, huh? Well, there is an old tire reef that I've known about all my life off straight I mean it's kind of offshore of the lost colony um the the amphitheater up here uh-huh. you know where they have yep, to play yep. and so you can look on the chart I mean you pick it up look on the chart right now and you can you can look kind of off the the you know, north end northeast end of Roanoke Island and you'll see it says obstruction or tire reef or something depending on which chart you're looking at well that is about a half a mile I mean, a ton of people have been up there looking for this tire reef on the numbers that the state had published, and it ain't there. So I never knew where it was. I ran across it arbitrarily because I've been asking the Lord for a new spot. Um, I, I went back to it. I, I just went right straight at my bubble trail, and I'm starting to see this just all this structure on the bottom. I'm hitting the button like, beep, you know, just as hard as I can hit the button going back across that stuff. And I marched a few fish, and I, I flipped one jig up there. And, and popped it about four times and caught a caught a, uh, about a 12 or 13 inch gray trout. Now for that to happen, it had to be salty for the gray trout to be yeah. you know, up that part of the sand. I caught a 12 or 13 inch gray trout and I and I looked at those guys. I said, I cannot wait till next summer. And they didn't know what I was talking about. We went on across the sound. We caught a bunch of speckled trout um, and went home. The ne- next year that spot again condition oriented you know it's in that part of the sound where if it's real wet there's not going to be many fish up there it'll be gars but it won't be in the speckled trout well the next year we had a lot of trout and we had the right conditions and that next year it i i promise because i can get back through this stuff i mean i promise if we didn't catch two thousand speckled trout off of that particular spot I'll kiss your foot. And it, it was tearing everybody's nerves up because they were like, what in the world? Where is all these fish coming from? I said, man, I love you, but I can't tell you because it, I was the worst clam lipper there's ever been. I share stuff now that I would have never shared years ago. And, um, and it, it's, it's a small place, 
Um, there's not a lot of tires there. And uh, I caught, or I, I jumped the tarpon off of it. I caught wow. a 12 and a half pound sheep's head off of it. Good gosh, the lightning. You're going to hear that thunder in just a second. <laughs> um, anyway, I got skylights in my office right here, and it looked like it just struck my office. But, but, oh, um, there, I heard the thunder. <laughs> yep, there it is. Well, uh, anyway, dude, I don't want to ramble on about that. No, I you're good. That, I was just sitting at the edge of my seat listening to that story. That's awesome. I wish we had more near shore, like some, some offshore, inshore fishing, if you will, like being able to fish yeah. structure. Yeah. We just don't have that. I mean, there's a little bit in the, in the new river, um, but it's all marked and it gets so beat up. But um, I'm sure there are some little secret spots that people have created out there that, that they go and fish. But I hear so I got, much uh, about that, that, near, that uh, inshore, offshore fishing, if you will, up there. And it just, I, I want to get up there and give it a shot one day. Have you had, you know, most summers when you get the right conditions, is that area pretty consistent that you found? Yeah, yeah, it was it was years, you know, years it stayed really good. Gotcha. Um and again, that's something that a lot of a lot of people around here um haven't taken time to develop. And I mean, you know it as well as I do, if somebody else don't show you a spot, you're probably never gonna find I mean, I'm talking about the general fishing population. Right. You know, they're fishing everybody else's fish. And um and Lord knows, I've you know I've I've watched some people before that I knew were good fishermen, and if I see a place, see a person on the spot of there, I'm gonna go find out why they're there. Oh yeah. Um, and, and go go figure out you know what they know that I don't know. And um, <laughs> the funny thing about that tire reef is, I told a boy up here that works with um, that works with the state. He's involved in the uh, resource enhancement. He does a lot of the plants the oyster reefs and you know does all that kind of stuff good buddy of mine he didn't believe me there was tarpon up there i took him up there one day and one rolled right beside the boat and i thought he was going to like freak completely out and um and that was a rarity but uh, anyway he called me um a, he, he knew i've been fishing it for years and he called me one day he's like man i'm getting ready to break your heart i knew it was coming because they had been placing artificial reefs in the pamlico sound consistently and he said, the guys from the state have called me and asked me, um, said they want to go out there and do a sonar uh, imaging of that spot because that's the next artificial reef they want to put in the sound. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. You, please don't tell me that's the case. So being a good sport, I went ahead and gave him my numbers so they wouldn't have to look around for it, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and so last year they showed up with the four reef balls and put buoys all the way around that thing and and you know put put a bunch of hard um uh like i don't know if it's reef balls or if they put shell or what they put up there's a hard bottom anyway yeah but they they took what was my little godsend honey hole um which wasn't even the size of a maybe three quarters of a football field of structure and have turned it into a massive you know hard bottom reef and a lot of people after they learn how to fish it, they'll catch fish up there. I'm tickled to death for the community now to have access to it, but I hate losing it as a my spot. Right, and, right. Uh, you know, that's that's just the way it goes. Yeah, but it makes me it, sad just hearing you about learn it. how to if you learn how to fish deep water in Dare County, um, and and develop some good deep water spots around here, it'll 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 catch you so many more speckled trout than because nobody else is fishing them, nobody's pounding them. And, and that's where the fish go when the water gets hot. Uh, it, they're deep water. You know, they're offshore. It's structure. Um, speckled trout, you alluded to earlier, you know, about how much speckled trout were, were like largemouth bass. Yeah. Um, they're very structure-oriented. And the thing about uh, the way they relate to structure is different to me than a bass does. Um, a, a trout, um, you know, one thing that we, we will fish up here quite a bit is uh is piers you know docks and piers and stuff like that and where um, a drum or a rockfish will relate to that structure tight you know they'll be tight on that structure a speckled trout will relate to it 30 yards away but they're still relating to that same structure and sometimes they'll do it on those reefs on that on that bottom structure too they may not be necessarily tight over top of it you know right right on it um, right around it, but yeah. depending on which way the current's moving, um, they may be 
you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 yards, typically it's always going to be down current. You know, I, I'm assuming they do the same thing down there, but mm-hmm. when I'm fishing structure up here, piers and bridges primarily, typically the fish are going to be down current where a rock fish will be, you know, on the, on the up current side of a piling, you know, a trout may be right behind it or, you know, three casts away from it, but he's most of the time going to be down current. But, um, I love that deep water structure, man. And I, I really think that, you know, let's talk, you know, we're in, I'm talking Dare County, um, around here, up here on the Outer Banks. If, if, uh, if a person wants to be the best or the most well-rounded trout fisherman they can be, you got to learn how to fish deep. Yeah. Uh, when the water gets hot, when the water gets hot, those, a lot of those fish will go deep. They may be shallow at daylight, you know, top water on a point on a marsh bank, um, you know, whatever. But typically, uh, they sail right on out and, and deep in a particular area might be six feet. It might be in a slough, it might be the deepest water there is around the whole entire flat. But a lot of those fish may get in that settle. But when you're talking about, you know, the Roanoke Sound or the Croatan Sound or whatever, um, and they've got access to 12 to 15 to 20 feet of water, then um, you got to learn how to fish that deep water, whether it's those reefs, and there's a, a number of them, you know, now that we have access to. Uh, the bridges are probably the most underutilized deep water structure um, that we have, you know, around. But there's some there's some docks that have the end of the docks are out there, you know, in 9, 10, 12 feet of water. Um, and those fish will come up there when they're feeding, and they'll slip back off in the channel when they're not. And um, so I... I one of the things I think that makes me a whole lot more well-rounded than I used to be was the ability or the understanding that if you don't know how to fish deep, you're going to get your feelings hurt a lot of days Yeah, in, yeah. The, summertime, in the summertime primarily. No, I think that's huge. And, and just understanding how those fish move in and out of deep water and, and different zones. Mm-hmm. Well, well, let's let's take a little turn and, and dive into some of the tackle that you like to use uh, when targeting speckled mm-hmm. trout up there, maybe we'll start with some soft plastics and, and kind of work our way through the hard baits and top water and stuff like that. Sure. Okay. Um, I, you know, I, I, I did bring some hard baits with me, um, cause I'm kind of passionate about, that's my yeah. little, that's my little gig right now. But, uh, <laughs> it, you know, we don't have to go, we don't have to get crazy deep into, um, the soft plastics. I do believe obviously more, more fish are caught on soft plastics every year than anything else. And, and there are the, um, the vast array of options to a speckled trout fisherman is unbelievable. And then if you cross over some bass baits, you know, and bring those into the mix as well, the sky's the limit on, yeah. uh, on soft plastics. And a lot of soft plastics have evolved from, um, you know, the largemouth fishing industry. Um, but, you know, you and I, I think, are you know, we're both big fans. I don't even have to ask, but uh, I know you're a big fan of Z-Man. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. I mean, it's not as, you know, intended to be a Z-Man plug, but you can't get away from or get around the fact that they have a huge um, uh, array of colors, selection of colors, and the, the size selections, um, you know, they're, they're just, they cover – a lot of what we need yeah and definitely they're there you, you can't tear them up um which is yeah, it's a big deal when you're charter fishing i mean it, it, every it gets up, expensive it gets for a dollar or whatever especially when you, you get know, into some bluefish mixed in with some trout yeah yeah one of the funniest things that i've ever seen i don't know if you've ever seen it before but when you get around you know those little those little bluefish little snappers uh-huh. 12 12 13 14 inches or whatever have you ever have you ever actually you know had one eat it and then eat it all the way to the, you know, he's popping it, popping it, and he's got him, and you fight him, and he doesn't have the hook in his mouth. He's just holding on to the paddle tail of like a three-inch <laughs> minnow. And um, and I have literally lifted bluefish out of the water, and him holding on to the tail of that Z-Man, and that thing stretching, and him shaking his head so violently, like, I'm going to get this thing, to, you know, if it kills me. Yeah. Um, you, you they're can, vicious. They're, God. And the bluefish, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they are. But uh, y- you just can't inshore fish and 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 not at least include some z-mans in what you're doing you just can't um there are so many other soft plastics that um that what i you know would typically say at this point is in your area 
I'm sure you can. It's going to be different than mine up here, but you got five colors um, that you're going to, it's going to be your go-to colors through the course of a day. And it's going to change maybe with light conditions, maybe with water clarity or whatever. But, you know, I could give you five colors pretty quick up here that I've always got on the boat. Yeah. And, uh, and so whether you're, you know, a Z-Man guy, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to go through all the different lore companies. There's a bunch of them. But um, the, you know, another thing that I'm a big fan of, especially with the Z-Mans, is, uh, is scent. You yeah. Know, I, I, be, I wholeheartedly believe that um, if you have the availability of scent, you know, whether it's Procure or, you know, it used to be um, smelly jelly. I don't know if you've ever seen smelly jelly yeah. before, but, dude, I have rubbed a many a gallon of smelly jelly on a curly tail grub, you know, over the years, years ago. And, um, and it all makes a big difference. And I don't think that, um, that you need to apply that stuff as much as a lot of people do. Um, uh, but you know, if you feel it, how greasy it is, man, have you ever, have you ever rubbed, you know, uh, procure on a hard bait? Oh yeah. And then, and then go back in your tackle box, you know, weeks later or the next spring and it's still just as greasy as it was when you put it up. <laughs> uh, so that that tells you that the stuff stays on the bait longer than you thought it did. Yeah. But um, one thing I learned from uh, – I, I always thought he was my great uncle. Well, it turns out he wasn't my uncle at all. But I, I grew up calling him Uncle Wick. <laughs> uh, Frank Wickenheiser, he's an old Navy, Navy veteran. He was on the cover of Time magazine. He was a fighter pilot. and ended up being a, a, a lawyer um, in the Navy. And – he married a lady from Wanchi's name Ain't Happy. And, of course, you know, growing up up here, everybody everybody's barefooted most of the time. And uh, Ain't Happy, old old school Wanchi'ser. Uncle Wit was, I think, related to, what's uh, got Lawrence Welk. The guy okay. that's got the old TV show with the, the ballroom dancing and the symphony and the orchestra, you know, whatever. But he would always, at the end of the day, at the end of a show, he would ask somebody in the audience to come up and, and dance with him and he knew that uh ain't happy was a really good ballroom dancer and he went and asked her to dance and she wouldn't get up she wouldn't go dance with him and come to find out the reason why she didn't wear any shoes to the lawrence wilk show so <laughs> she didn't have any shoes on when it come time you know to get up and dance with yeah. him so that was always kind of funny to me well, Uncle that is Rick, funny he fished he he learned how to speckle trout fish he's from north dakota and uh big just a big man big gruff you know, man, love trout fishing. He taught me two things um, when we used to fish together. He'd always get mad at me, you know, because I, I was always late, 17, 16, 17, 18 years old. I beat him all around the sound in a 16-foot Carolina skiff. And um, and he did not go fishing if he didn't have a bag of shrimp that he could tip his hook with, you know, just a little teeny, cut little teeny pieces of shrimp and tip, tip his hook. And he'd get 10 million croaker bites and pigfish, pinfish, whatever. But he always caught more fish than me. And he, he was adamant that it was the scent was the only reason that he was catching more fish than wow. he was. So that taught me something. And two, um, you know, up here, uh, these fish, you know, these move, they move uh, up and down the shoreline, on and off the, the shoals or the flats or whatever. And they move around a lot. And, um, and so if we ever got to a place on a, on a point, uh, on a piece of shoreline or whatever, and the conditions looked right. Water water was clean. It have to be clear, but clean water, um, you know, some bait around or whatever, and it was worth making one cast. If it looked good enough to make a cast, then it was, then in, in his opinion, you had to sit there for 30 minutes. If I ever put my anchor in the water, he would not let me pull it up for 30 minutes. <laughs> and sometimes I would be bored out of my mind. And he would never miss a beat, cast and cast and changing colors, changing jig head sizes, this side of the boat, that side of the boat. And invariably, fish would would move to us or he would figure out the right color or whatever and we would start catching fish. Wow. So uh, talk, talk me a, a, about patience in, in trout fishing. And that's one thing I've tried to teach a lot of other people. Is, man, if you just run and gun trout fishing, you're going to miss a lot of opportunities to catch a lot of speckled trout. I've sat there for 29 minutes and 47 seconds and not had a bite. And in the last 13 seconds, he'll catch one and he'll turn around and look at me. 
and then it's on because the tide's right, the whatever. I don't know what happened. Salooner table, whatever. But the next hour and a half, you catch one every other cast. Wow. And so be patient with those things. But that was in the old school days when it was three colors of curly tail grubs. That's all you had. That's what everybody went fishing with, you know, three or four colors yeah. of curly tail. Yeah. Now there's so many soft plastic options. 300,000 <laughs> options. Do you remember, I was uh, talking to a buddy of mine the other day that he's like, we were talking about colors. He's like, man, he said, you know, I can't find anymore. He, he asked me if I remembered. He said, do you remember the old uh, finesse devil fish? And uh, I just started grinning because not only do I remember it, and I remember the hundreds of speckled trout that, that uh, we've caught on that thing, you know, years ago. I'm talking back in the, in the you know, probably mid-90s or something. Um, finesse was one of those crossover companies mm -hmm. that uh, made it into saltwater fishing from the bass industry. Lunker City sluggo you remember a, a, a bait called oh, yeah. sluggo i remember the you know, sluggo the yep well that was also a really good it wasn't a great color selection but that was a good speckled trout bait okay uh, with a jig head or without you know just just weightless and um well the lunker city finesse was they come it they they introduced they really introduced color to the, the trout fishing world um in a major league way and and a, a bait that was good up here that nobody ever saw or knew anything about was called a devil fish. It's a black, a black like Coca Cola black with a deep red um, back and 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 gold flakes in it. And in dark water, I would take that bait over over anything. Well, wow. I still have some packs of it. And um, so it's it's interesting how the color selections go over time. But anyway, I know you've covered covered that kind of stuff, and we don't have to go there. But scent is a big deal yeah bar none i don't like making casts unless i have squirted some kind of something on a on a bait and um but one of the things i've been doing um this year and we've talked about it before but i've been having a ball you kind of go through you know these seasons where you kind of you really dig in one particular kind of bait or one particular you know method or whatever and um this year for me has been going back to the old school bass fishing days and um, fishing with jerk baits this time of year have you ever fished many jerk baits this time of year i haven't fished jerk baits much in the summer honestly it's it's more of a when i'm fishing mirror lures and other suspending twitch baits in the winter time and fall is when i when i fished i fished them for bass in the summer um but never for right. for, for speckled trout really yeah so the, the everybody is typically going to have that same answer yeah man i'll throw mirror lures in the fall cold water you know, slow metabolism, um, and you may fish it, you know, twitch, 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 and then pause and just let that thing kind of sit there, um, you know, in that in that cold water time. But, dude, I promise you, you can get your arm snatched off this time of year <laughs> on on a on a stick bait or a jerk bait or whatever you want to call them. And, and I brought some of those with me, and, you know, I, I didn't intend for this to look like a Rapala commercial. But the interesting thing is that they have, in, in the depths that I fish, in the styles of stick baits and stuff that I fish, they cover the water column for me about as good as anybody, yeah. in, you know, in the colors that I like. Um, and I, I, I was fishing with a buddy of mine the other day and throwing an X-Wrap. And you know what an X-Wrap is. Mm -hmm. this, this is, you know, just a, a typical little black back silver yep. sided the smaller version you know a little x wrap and i was throwing that thing and we were catching speckled trout on a on a marsh point and this was during the week uh the week ahead of that full moon when so many people were catching so many big speckled trout everywhere there was more big speckled trout caught up here in one week than a, than i've seen caught through a course of a summer wow um you know, 27, 28, a couple of 29s. I mean, guys that have been fishing for 20 years catching their biggest fish that they've ever had on their boat, and it was all in the same week. And so I just knew, man, you probably like me. I was just like every cast, I'm going to catch me a 30 inch. Yeah. And that's every cast, that's what I had in the back of my mind. And I was throwing that crazy little thing, and I, and I threw it up across the point and twitched it down and tried to get it down in the, where I wanted it to be. And something a sea monster of some sort he hit that thing so hard i know it was a 30 inch speckled trout and it's my story and i'll tell it like i want to 
And so, but something hit that bait so hard that I felt it in my hand and the back of my head at the same time. It was such a violent bite that I almost had to sit down. And the boy I was with was like, man, what was that? I said, I, I have no idea what just happened and how I missed that fish. I've never been hit. It felt like somebody hit me in the head with a ball peen hammer. That's <laughs> how, how violent that strike was. The whole rod just shook. And anyway, um, I saw, I was like, okay, I, there's no way I can not throw these things on my personal fishing time. That's what I'm doing this summer. Yeah. I can probably catch a fish on a, um, on soft plastics and my, my clients, you know, that's, that's what we'll be fishing in soft plastics. But when they're casting soft plastics, I'm throwing hard baits. And the one that I've caught so many fish on, um, so far has been this, this X wrap right here. And you see, it's that purple yep. kind of a chartreuse side. <laughs> you can see the, the, I mean, they've just destroyed this thing. Yeah. It looks like it's been and, chewed a few times. Oh yeah, man. The, um, the, the thing about these, these Rapalas and, and where I'm fishing is it's all about water column. Okay. And so th they have, and most bait companies do, but um, so say two and a half feet to about eight feet of water um, around structure or just in open water across, mainly some of my best fishing has been across shoals or submerged points uh, where the current's running across, bait fish running across or whatever. And so, you know, the X-Rap, that dude's going to be, say, he's my, my four, he's my, my four to five foot guy. Okay. Um, and, or, you know, and I can fish it, fish, say three to five feet. That's my man right there. But I really like fishing. Now, this is a rip stop. Okay. Uh-oh. See that little guy right there? God, those little, colors little are bad eye. right there. I like that. Oh, yeah, man. Look at that. Again, it's that purple, purple gold kind of scenario. Small lip. Um, it's a lighter bait, smaller profile. You see that little, he's got a little tail fin on there. Mm -hmm. And this dude right here, when you're, when you fish it, he, it, it's an immediate stop. I mean, he just, ha, ah, ha, ah, and stops perfectly. Um, and he stays in a, so I'll fish this guy in like, three feet of water or shallower and 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 really ripping it you know that's the way it was intended on fishing and and they'll they'll whack it and then mm. the uh again you see that purple oh yeah purple and gold just a great color combination it's not the only one that works you must be an ecu fan no <laughs> i don't have a a lot of problem with ecu but um they uh that looks like it should be called a pirate right there, don't it? It does. But that's, that's the shadow wrap. Different profile. See that thicker profile? Yep. Maybe a little bit more Menhaden looking. Yeah. Um, you know, thicker mullet looking or whatever. Um, that shadow wrap, and this is, again, going to be, say, my three, my three-foot guy, four-foot guy. And then they make a, it's a shadow wrap in the deep version with that lip right there. Yep. And like this same color, same color situation. Um, and this guy casts pretty good, but so, you know, you can fish this thing down. If you just get it down light line and just keep your rod tip low and wind it, you can get it down, you know, to maybe eight foot. Um, I like, I like snapping it. I think that, that jerk bait style fishing as opposed to a crank bait style fishing provokes more strikes. And so I feel like I'm typically fishing it maybe in a six or seven foot range, but from seven foot to two foot, those baits I just showed you, they cover it. Yeah. And man, when, when you get whacked, it is one heck of a bite. So you take, you know, just expand. I would just encourage everybody to expand their thinking. Yeah. Um, and, and, and get on that stick bait bite when you got some current or you're seeing some bait or, you know, four foot of water, the fish are kind of laying, you know, you just need to cover some water and you want to get thumped, then that'll, that'll do it right there. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I like those colors too. I don't have any of those uh, jerk baits in that color. And in Rapala, the Rapala has got a, just some awesome selection of hard baits and some of their baits that they've made that fish a lot like some of their mirror lures. I fished some of those as well. And I had a day 
with my buddy that he hooked multiple big fish on. Um, yeah, that's the bait right there. That bait right there. But he hooked three fish on that bait that were studs. I mean, you could tell yep. big toilet bowl flush after he hooked them. And with those single yep. hooks, he kept pulling them off. He pulled every one of them off. Do you like the single uh, hooks? Have you had trouble with them, or do you like to switch them over to trebles? I, man, the problem, and I'm gonna, uh, it's hard to answer that question because I don't like trebles. Gotcha. I don't. Uh, and you think about how soft a speckled trout's mouth is. Yeah. Um, you, you will, you know, if they're eating it, uh, you're going you're gonna to tear one up every now and then um, with, you know, a couple sets of trebles or whatever. Definitely. But I completely concur with what you're saying about um, not being able to keep one stuck on that bigger bait, with a, on that hard bait with a single hook. Yeah. And so, look, here's the deal. So we got the – me and you both just got off the Roanoke River. Yep. And – you know, up there it's mandatory. Oh, I hate that rig right there. <laughs> the, the single, the single hook um, on all the artificials up there, and one that's not a bad speckled trout topwater bait either. No, but you see the rockfish have eaten the color off of it. But um, you know, that's my rig uh, that I throw up there a lot. See the, the barb is pinched yep. or whatever. Um, and now, thank God that uh, Mustad was the first one I saw to do it. This is actually a mirror lure hook, but they're actually making the hook with the eyes turn um, 90 degrees okay. from, from what they are. So so the, the hook actually lies with a with a point down yep. with one split ring. So I had, I had for years, I've been fishing baits up there on the river that I had to put two split rings in order to get my hook to lay correctly. Gotcha. That makes sense, mm -hmm. and a lot of people like to put just that one single hook off the back because uh, the fish will come up there and, and short. But when a fish are eating, ninety nine percent of the time they're going, especially speckled trout, they eat it from the side. You know, they whack that thing, and um, so that is that is a setup that I'll use, and I just haven't changed the hooks back out on that. That's a running river rig, yeah. But it'll work for a speckled trout. But if you got the barbs pinched when you're speckled trout fishing, you ain't gonna catch very many of them. No. <laughs> A treble hook, a treble hook is hard on a fish. You it know is. it as well as I do. And but the interesting thing is how those thin wire treble hooks will pull out of a fish, especially if you hook them in the side of the head. You know, mirror lure hooks will pull out. You know, yeah. the bigger the bigger hooks on the mirror lure. So, and I promise you, them little thin Rapala hooks, if he's not hooked real good, you know, you'll lose a fish every now and then. But um, I do like conservation wise. You know that they have gone to that setup. Yeah, I do too. Uh, but it was hurting I our promise, feelings the other day, though. <laughs> I promise you, people are going to get their feelings hurt. That's exactly what I was getting ready to say. And it, you know, you just got to kind of take it for what it's worth and and um, decide where you stand on that situation yeah, and definitely. see if you're willing to to put up with losing a few fish. It ain't nothing that hurts worse in this world to see that big toilet flush out there, and you know you got a heck of a bite and. Um, and, and the fish is pulling drag. He's just a different fish. I mean, mm -hmm. a, a, when they get like 24, 25 inches from there on, they're a different fish. That totally than a different 15, fish. 16, 17 inch fish, man. And when you even got a 21, him, 22 inch fish, they're so different. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And and when you got them, and when you and you know it's him, and then all of a sudden, it just come and it, you're like, what in the world just happened? I mean, yeah, I have to fresh. bite my tongue. I'm not. I'm, I don't use choice words very often, but when I pull off a big trout, uh, everything in me wants to let one fly. So, yeah. Um, so it, here, here's one thing that I think, Judd, and I, you know, could be wrong, but um, that I've got to pay attention to, especially with clients. Yeah. So when there's a lot of current. Yep. And or if you're drifting, and and you're covering some water or whatever, and you know there's big fish around, man, you you got to back the drags off. Because what happens a lot of time is is you're just putting too much pressure on that fish, and those, and those hooks will pull out. Yeah, definitely. And, and so we had a situation the other day, and a guy, a guy, he actually bent down there and grabbed his spool because it was pulling drag. <laughs> and he, when he grabbed his spool, he pulled the hooks. I'm like, dude, we're drifting at like two and a half knots with the wind and the current, and 
And so you've automatically got all that drag on a big fish. And when he turns sideways in the current and you're just the hook, I mean, you can't help but pull them out. Yeah. So you really got to baby those fish, you know, different than you do catching 15 inches that you can just wind right to the boat, you know, skipping on top. Yeah, and a lot of people don't realize that. The same thing with trebles too. I, I watch a, I watch this YouTube channel I've talked about on here before, but it's called Tactical Bassin, and it's these guys from California that are like, I mean, just so dialed in. I mean, they'll talk about a single jerk bait for an hour on one YouTube video, gotcha. and it, it's, it's some really great stuff. A lot of stuff I've learned to yeah. apply for trout fishing, um, but just talking about the importance of if you're fishing treble hooks and hard baits, the importance of a really soft tip rod. Because those trebles, when right. those fish turn Absolutely. their heads, you need a lot of give. If you're fishing Absolutely. a stiff rod, when that fish turns or pulls, you're going to pull those hooks out a lot more. Same with the topwater. Like, you know, a nice, really soft tip rod for a topwater, you'll pull fish on the on, – you'll pull redfish, trout, all, all, all of them. So um, I think that's huge. Well, speaking and of topwater – oh, what were you going to say? No, I'll say, well, the, and, and it, to me, it's that much more important now – that everybody's throwing a braided line or yeah. a single filament super line. Yeah, there's no um, stretch. No, there's none. And you can get away with it with monofilament, you know, years ago, but hardly anybody is throwing mono except for some – the bass guys actually still throw it quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but I don't see hardly anybody, saltwater guys, that throw that throw much mono anymore that are, you know, they're dialed in and fishing fishing right along. Yeah. And I, and I, I feel like I know where you were going. Yeah. Um, is you know we'll move into some top water yeah. stuff real quick and i got a bait i want to show you that i think you'll get a kick out of because right i know i know that you like um you know painting painting baits and creating some of your own color combinations yeah. and stuff like that i'll tell you a funny story about this this guy right here um it's probably been about seven or eight years ago i uh was walking through i think walmart in williamston uh-huh you know and there was a a, a box down there on the on the bottom of the shelf, and there was a ton of these topwater baits uh, for a dollar, and I bought about you know fifteen or twenty of them, and they got a they got a really heavy oh, yeah. knocker in them, um, and they were really easy to walk the dog with. They like little torpedoes, really easy action. They cast really well. I was like, you know, it's a perfect speckled trout size, rockfish size, or whatever. And then I took some and sent them, I uh, took the hooks off of them and sent them to a buddy of mine named Kevin in Little Washington, he's a big bass fisherman, that paints baits. You know, he, he, he paints his own crankbaits. I said, dude, I want you to paint me some, um, a, 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 a top water bait, take these, and paint me one like an 808 mirror lure. You know, orange belly, kind of a gold side, silver side, whatever you send me, just surprise me with a black back. And I have caught so many speckled trout and so many puppy drum, you know, redfish on this dude right here. Yeah. And you that orange belly. Well, what, you know, this is where you'll get a kick out of it. You see that foil in there? Uh-huh. Like, what in the heck is that? How did, you know. It looks like scales bait, almost. Yeah. Well, the bait was smooth um, that I sent him. And I get that back and I said, man, what is that? And he said, that's trade secret, dude. I can't tell you. I said, man, don't give me that crap. What in the heck? How did you do that? He said, that is Wrigley spearmint chewing gum wrapper that has been balled up and then glued to the side of that thing to make it look <laughs> like scales. I said, that's, that's hilarious. Well, the fish have eaten the coating off of it now. And you know, the, the Wrigley spearmint wrapper is starting to come through, but you know, you should try that sometime on a clear coating. Yeah, coat. I definitely will. Um, put you some scale pattern, but you know, any, any of those walk the dog, um, style baits, the speckled trout, just like a rockfish or whatever, they're just, they are hard for one to resist. But, you know, I know you fish a lot of them down there. And um, how much do you see that that cadence, you know, day in and day out, that cadence makes a huge difference? Is it daily or do you have one cadence do you stick with? I mean, playing around with the walk for speckled trout definitely helps out. And when it's the cooler it is, a lot of times I'll pause that bait for a while and let it sit and then click, mm. click, 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 and let it sit or click, 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 let it sit. That's right. Yeah. But one big thing that I've noticed, and I'll stay on my clients about it or, or anyone that I'm fishing with, is like if you're not walking the dog well, like if it's jumpy and you're reeling too fast while you're trying to you know twitch that bait – You'll lose a, yeah. I mean, you'll you'll forfeit a lot of you know fish biting that lure, 
Uh, you know, red but, fish are still kind of aggressive and will come up and, and, and slap at it. But there's something about that, you know, timed out walking the dog motion that's right. that gets more bites than when you're just kind of, if it's skipping a little bit or diving every once in a while. I mean, it, it pays off to really learn how to walk that thing really smooth. Um, but but yep. yeah, cadence. It's some days it's like they want it fast. Some days it's like they want it slow and paused. Um, that's right. Do you see it really play a big deal up there? Yeah, yeah. That's that's the main thing. You know, a lot of people will go, and I'll get people on the boat. I'm like, you know how to walk the dog? They're like, oh yeah, I bass fish some, and you can't get them to to change the cadence. Yeah, you know, they got their regular rhythm. You know, it's the wind and the rhythm. It's a regular. Um, you know, it's a good rhythm. It works well for what they're doing. I mean, they can walk it well, but like you said, they just miss so many miss so many fish because um, where I'll be behind them, or somebody else will be twitch, 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 and making it slap, 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 crush. You know? Yeah. And those guys all the way to the boat, never pause, never slow down. Yeah. Some days they eat it like that. And some days, man, you got to really just let that thing glide and pause, twitch, 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 glide and pause. And you'll watch them in that clear water. You'll see that fish come up underneath of that thing and grab it. Yeah. So the pause is a big – same thing, popping cork fishing. We have not talked anything really about popping corks, but we use a lot of those up here over the grass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, and, and, and it's the same deal, man. It's the cadence some days makes – some days you just throw it out there and just – snatch it all the way back to the boat and they'll and they'll snatch it out of your hand but other days man that cadence can make a big difference we don't have enough time i know we're, we'll get too long we don't have enough time to go into the different styles of popping corks the different cadences and all that stuff but it's just that's that's something you got to have in your arsenal in dare county just like you do anywhere else in the speckled trout lives. yeah definitely uh, yeah knowing your lures and, and knowing the you know the different variations and how to fish them can be can be huge um, do you do you do large pops usually for for the speckle trout there? Or is it, are you really trying to make that little slappy noise usually? It, all of the above. Gotcha. Again, I, I I like to to let the fish dictate what I do. See, yeah. You know, you got clients on the boat. It's um, you just you know tell them this is what I want you to do, and they send it out there and they do what they're going to do, trying to figure it out on their own. But whatever they're doing, I'll do something different. And, and make sure that we're not missing a rhythm or a cadence that the fish is willing to eat. Yeah. Also, you know, I don't know about you, but, you know, I got three guys plus me, 99 times out of 100, we got four different colors on. Yeah. And, you know, we're going to try to figure out, you know, what they're, what they're willing to eat and then progressively change over to everybody throwing the same color. Yeah. If it's necessary. Sometimes it's not necessary. Sometimes the fish will eat four different colors just as you know equally as well but every now and then you got to kind of you know you got to you got to switch up because one will outfish the other that particular time of day definitely definitely but, yeah so the 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 cup the original you know cup face um popping cork like we use for the big drum fishing or whatever the one that really makes the slurp yep um uh, yeah you know it, i was always of the opinion when i was fishing up around manio uh, over the grass I was just using a regular old like cigar style, Mm -hmm. um, long slender cork with the the beads on both ends, um, unweighted, you know, just unweighted cork. And man, we were catching, I mean, dude, we caught, I mean, one summer, you know, just right here around Manio, we caught like four or 5,000 speckled trout. It was unbelievable. And a lot of them were on that cork. And, um, and I always said, until somebody outfishes me on a different cork, consistently that i'm gonna stick with what i got yeah and you know so again you get hard-headed sometimes um and now i don't even hardly throw that cork anymore <laughs> i got i got down around the inlet fishing on a lot of that grass down there i still don't throw the cup face one as much but i do fish the bigger um the bigger uh style rounded cork yeah i don't yeah. know what you've come that thing it's like above. a smushed ball almost uh Exactly, yeah. like elliptical shape, you know. Yeah. But I can make the slurping noise with that, or I can make the big pop if I want to. Yeah. So I, I think it's probably a more well-rounded scenario. Yeah. Um, than either one of the other two. That's that's good information. I've never gotten that into the the corks there as far as trout fishing goes. 
Um, but yeah, yeah I, I see how you could just get the little light pops, but that thing has enough drag that you can pop it real good. Um, one oh, yeah. one thing that I've noticed that I, that I, I want to share with with people that, and we I know it's, it does sound like we're sponsored by Z Man, which I'm not. I don't know if you're sponsored by Z Man, um, but a Z Man under a cork is a great uh, bait for it because the the fact that Z Man floats when you like you know you fish normal baits. When you let it sit, that bait's going to fall down and that tail is going to be pointing towards the bottom, like a denser, soft plastic. But those Z-Mans will sit perfectly level in the water. After you twitch it yeah. and let it sit, and they'll settle back down and they'll be sitting, you know, mm -hmm. uh, parallel to the bottom. So it actually is, is how a fish would be sitting in the water column, which, I mean, That's I'm right. sure it plays into it a decent amount because a, a fish hanging, you know, tail down, head up is, is, is not very natural looking. It's amazing how many, how many bites um over the years that i've seen um I mean, literally you just put you throw a popping cork out there and put the rod in the rod holder yeah. and let rodney fish and and that thing just a little bit of wind a little bit of wind ripple and that bait suspended and and next thing you know you know sometimes it's a pretty aggressive bite i mean like bow right over and other yeah. times you just watch that cork just barely slip under and start swimming off yeah and and that's when you know that those fish are willing to eat it, but they're not aggressive. Yeah. And if you throw and throw and throw, and you're popping a fool out of it, and you, you know you're not going to get a bite. But um, if you slow that thing down, pop it. You know, eat one of them square nabs, pop it. <laughs> you know, and take a drink of drink, and just slow down. Then those fish, it's crazy. Speckled trout are around us all the time, and they are so persnickety. Which remember, uh, Doctor Sellers, I told you that was one of his words persnickety when he was talking about trout fishing in the mountains and we're throwing size 28 griffin snats up there with ice in our guides and he's looking at a fish called him persnickety i said he's not persnickety he's cold <laughs> but you know anyway that um speckled trout the same way yeah. they're just persnickety they're they're peculiar i think it's the reason so many people like them i think there's a lot more of them around us on a lot of days and we just ain't good enough to catch them yeah but you know it makes them fun it does make them fun um it's they're just a fun fish all around the more i fish for them the more i love them and the more i hate them so that's right <laughs> but uh well, yep. well cool well man it's been a great podcast and and like we talked about beforehand uh pre-show i, I want to do a couple or continue to do podcasts with you because i i think sure. that your area your region um there's a lot to learn from that area and there's a lot of people that want to come up there and fish that area and learn and and whatnot mm -hmm. so i think that would be huge but um is there any any last words you want to leave people with before we close this podcast out? Um, I can't really think of anything right now. I'm sure I'll think of a thousand things driving back to the house in a minute. Hey, we'll just but, write them uh, down. We'll talk about them the next one. <laughs> yeah, you know, next time let's. Um, you know, I already told you before. I got to tell you my 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 melanoma story. Yeah, we definitely, definitely got to cover that. Definitely, and uh, and it, you know, we can. We can go into some different species or different techniques, or whatever you want to do. I, yeah. I enjoy it. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, really definitely, definitely. And one thing I'll tell everybody is, you know, there's a lot better speckled trout fishermen up here than I am. Um, but I feel like that if you got more spots than the next guy, you know, you'll end up putting yourself in a good situation or a good position. Yeah. And that's that's with anybody. And um, so don't don't miss an opportunity if you've got time to look at this spot and why it's producing, pay attention to, um, you know, the, the, everything, everything about it, and then go replicate that as many times as you can and develop a huge, a huge amount of spots and learn, you know, so that, that's just the biggest deal that I can think of. And I'm sure it's the same way down there where you are, but it's a really big deal up here because we don't have that current you know that, that to deal with and some days the current goes one way for three days because the wind blows that way and then when the wind falls out it might come the other way for three days <laughs> and you don't ever know what it's going to do until you get up and put the boat in the water so you got to have a lot of spots to be able to deal with the, the, the conditions yeah. that are so dynamic and so unpredictable right yeah it keeps you on your toes for sure um, yeah, man. Well, well, cool. Well, awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to uh, to doing another one. I'm gonna close this one out here. Well, guys, thank you all so much for listening to another Eastern Current episode or watching another Eastern Current episode, whether you're on YouTube or or any of the podcast platforms that this podcast is on. 
Um, but thank you again, Brian. What a great show, uh, and, and we look forward to having you on again. And until next time, guys, I uh, hope you're out there catching up some speckled trout this summer. Later.